Okay, let's get started. Um, before I get going, quick audio check. Can people hear what I'm saying? It looks more like my boosted microphone is occasionally going like too loud, but hopefully that's not too much of a problem. It's only if I get into it too much and start yelling at the mic, which is unlikely to happen. At the moment, the, the voice is a little tired, to tell you the truth. Okay, so as this is a live stream, not a lecture, it's a little bit more informal than what we would normally have. Um, I had this idea of making slides, and if I had this afternoon and this evening to prep for tomorrow's live stream, I would have done some slides. But what I'm going to do instead is I'm just going to do it all live. So there are diagrams I wanted to show you. Some of the diagrams are in the spec, and I will just explain those diagrams. Otherwise, I'm going to use my awesome Microsoft Paint skills <laughs> and do the diagrams live. Um, I think that should probably be OK. Um, I do have a drawing tablet, usually but the drawing tablet is still at UNSW, and I'm just like, it's not really worth my while to take an extra trip out of the house, even though I think it would be reasonably safe. I still just don't think it's necessary. So um, I'm going to work with my mouse and my computer. Um, my, my entirety of prep for today is a bunch of stuff written on my phone here, which is like, talk about this, then talk about this, and talk about this. So we're going to... Um, uh, we're going to go through the second assignment, and we're going to talk about some of the um, some of the details. <laughs> Hello, did you want to say hi to everyone? Okay. So, chicken was trying to say hi just then. I don't know if she's trying to say hi or she's saying, "Feed me! It's the afternoon. I want food." But there's a little little bit of hello from chicken. She doesn't know how to look at the camera, but you know, there she is. Okay, you go down there. Alright, so, assignment two, called Beats by CSE. <laughs> the, the funny thing about this assignment is the working title that I put on the assignment was Beats by Dr. Chi, because I was being a douche. Um, and I enjoyed that title a lot for a very short amount of time and then decided not to make the assignment about me and make the assignment about you instead. So I called it Beats by CSE. So the idea of this assignment, this was Tom's idea um, to start off with actually, um, that he, um, he came up with this idea because I said, okay, throwing out ideas to some of my senior tutors was like, what are some interesting things we can do with linked lists? And so he came up with the idea, well, what about um, a like a music sequencer? So we have a sequence of, of time steps, and each time step has some notes in it. And it's like, oh, that's really cool. We can get like a linked list of linked lists like that, and that'll be really interesting. It's a good thing to have a, a big chunk of work for people to work on, and that's how Beats by CSE started out. So it started out as a... Um, uh, as the idea that we can string together music and linked lists are pretty good for that because music's not of a fixed length You know, we can't just say every song is exactly three minutes long or something like that, right? So the theme kind of carried quite nicely like that um, Question there by Sayed, Sayed, I, I apologize if I say your name wrong, is VLab going to be available over the weekend and Will it be affected by the IT maintenance? Um we're not sure. Tom thinks it might not be. Uh, I'm not sure, because I think the home drives that they're talking about are not your CSE home drives. However, the login that you use to CSE authenticates against the UNSW servers. So there might be a situation where um, all the stuff is actually working, VLAB's working, and things like that. But when you try to log in, it tries to ping the... Uh, UNSW's own servers and I can't find them. That is the only... Oh, it doesn't. Is it just using the ZID, Tom? Is that not... Ah, okay. There's, there's a very good chance that we won't notice at all if we're using VLAB. Um, we'll see how it goes. Um, that would be really nice. Uh, and hopefully nothing goes weird to prove Tom wrong there, which is great. Um, yeah, so if we're lucky that downtime will only affect the official UNSW resources, which are separate to CSE school resources, which is VLAB and the um, directories that you use to do CSE work. Because you would have noticed by now, right? 
that if you if you look at your UNSW home directory and the files that are in there, it's different from the files that you see when you're on VLAB because they're actually different systems. So we have it running on our own Linux systems um, to teach you specific programming things. Um, some other, ooh, are help sessions scheduled over the weekend, Tom? I don't know if help sessions are scheduled over the long weekend. I assume that they're not. So everyone's gonna have to survive for four days um, on the course forum, I guess. Look, I'm not gonna guarantee a whole lot of activity on the course forum from people answering. So this is very um, dependent on the spare time of the tutors who work on the course forum. So you notice Dean and Tammy spend a lot of time on the course forum. They're getting paid to work on the course forum. Whether they actually have time this long weekend to do that or not is, um, is their choice. Uh, not ever really going to ask them to work on the weekend like that. Um, so we'll see. If anything, it'll just be like, let's take chill for a bit, stay at home, play some computer games, something like that over the weekend, instead of just, you know, the continual hammering of content that we have. Because, you know, it's kind of like, this is something that happens to lecturers a lot, is we want to teach you everything, you know? There's so many things I want to teach you, so many amazing things. Someone else wants to be on the live stream. I think I better put her out of the room, otherwise she's just gonna keep talking while I talk. One second. Come on. Okay, goodbye. <laughs> this is a hilarity of um, uh, uh, live streaming as my cat just gets involved. I think that you're quite privileged as a group of um, Comp 1511 students because no one in Comp 1511, um, the whole last year that I taught it, has ever seen chicken. But you see chicken like nearly every week now. <laughs> and, and as far as I can tell, chicken's more popular than I am. So, you know, always a lot of fun. Okay. Um, yeah, so over the long weekend, we will just sort of support each other as much as we can. I think you can also answer each other's questions if you like. Um, we will always try to check if 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 you as students are answering other people's questions, just to make sure they're exactly the 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 same ideas that we have. But like, even if even if we do correct your answer to someone's questions, I still think it's worth you talking to each other and things like that. I mean, it creates an environment where we help each other, which is much better than a kind of environment when we're like competing against each other or we're holding ideas back from each other. I don't really like that. I prefer it if we're, we're always trying to help each other, even if we're not always right, trying to help each other. The whole kind of idea behind that is, is a good thing to have. Especially at the moment, you know, we've got all this massive, like, virus going around and, like, making a whole lot of people sick and stuff. Getting us into the feeling that we're, you know, the reason why we're staying at home and not going out and stuff is because we want to help other people. Like, it's not because we don't want to get sick ourselves or it's not because we think we're sick and we're going to make other people sick. It's because we know that this thing passes through humans, so the less humans we have moving around there, the better it is for anyone who who might get the coronavirus. So it's like the idea that staying home, sitting on your couch and playing computer games, watching TV and stuff is you helping the rest of the world and hopping on the forums, asking questions for other students is you helping other students learn. And as I was saying before, the more we help each other, the better environment we end up in. And as teams working on things, the better that environment is, the more successful we are in general. So yeah. Just a little bit on the side, see what everyone's talking about there. Mm -mm 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 -mm. <laughs> Chicken's the reason we went viral on Tuesday. Um, that was really um, alarming, actually. Um, Tuesday's lecture ended up with some 3,000 views, and I was like, we don't have that many students. <laughs> it's like, who, the, who are all these people? I actually turned off all the public stuff, I turned off public recommendations and all this stuff's going out unlisted now. So it's it's really just um, going to be only us in these sessions, um, but I'm allowing it to be public for viewing afterwards. So we'll see if the lecture afterwards gets thousands of views as well. I'm hoping it doesn't, dies back down and it's just us. I have no intention of monetizing this YouTube channel or anything like that. It's more of a necessity uh, than it is um, something I'm trying to grow into anything in particular. I did joke about going viral 
Anyone know Eddie Wu and WooTube? I'm assuming that a whole bunch of people who have just finished their HSC know about WooTube. But um, yeah, I've watched some of his stuff, and he's got his like, really nice manner when he teaches and stuff, and so it's like, oh, I'm going to go on YouTube, I'm going to be like Eddie Wu, but um, I think I probably don't want the level of internet fame that Eddie Wu has. <laughs> yeah, I can see a lot of people are like, hey, we know him, yeah. So um, yeah, I think we just want to keep it to the course for now. Um, <laughs> GTube win. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of people saying they liked uh, Eddie Wu, and I can I can see that. Uh, and if we get to a certain point, then yes, I will I will start ChiTube, and you can like tell everyone about ChiTube. But I just don't think that there's as much of a need for people to learn introductory C programming as there is for people to learn how to do basic high school maths. I think that's much more important what he's doing. Um, for us, yes, of course, programming C is very important to us, and learning the fundamentals of programming is very important to us in terms of um, continuing in computing careers, but there's no reason that this needs to be like a nationwide YouTube or anything like that, teaching all Australians about how to start programming. So, <laughs> we'll see about that. <laughs> I'll publish a book and stuff. So yeah, he was your actual teacher, so you are in his class. What a brush with fame. <laughs> that's very cool um, although in essence you could kind of prefer to have someone else as your teacher and then watch your stuff on YouTube then you get two different views on things you only got one view on thing, things but then at least you even get to ask questions of the famous Eddie Wu I've been to Cherry Brook High School just once but I went there for completely other reasons like I went there to, to play um, miniatures games because they have an, an annual um, tournament day out there Anyway, we are digressing here. Let's go back to the assignment itself. So I wanted to talk about Beats by CSE here and what the assignment is. So it's, it's kind of a little bit of a throwback to the era of digital music production. And, and I say the era of mu digital music production in nearly a historical sense, but it's definitely not over. It's not over to the point where the idea of digital music production has nearly overtaken the idea of music production in general. So it's nearly that playing live music with live instruments only and no digital equipment is, um, is really a thing of the past that not many people are doing. And even the purely acoustic instruments, like if we look at like a chamber orchestra or something like that, everything they do is still going to be recorded digitally as well. But we're thinking in this assignment, we're thinking about um, digital music, as in music that's actually synthesized by computers, and some music that has sort of sequenced time steps and different pitches that it can broadcast and things like that. Um, so that's the, the general idea that we're going with for CS Beats. Um, in no way is, is CS Beats the exact kind of architecture that we would expect to see in digital music production but just thematically it fits in nicely so it's cool i mean the same as minesweeper i have no um no expectation that minesweeper is definitely a two-dimensional array of integers although if i was going to program from scratch i would think about doing it with a two-dimensional array of integers if i was programming a music production system from scratch i don't know whether i would necessarily do it with linked lists or not I might, I might not. Um, it's a much more difficult situation than mine, so it's much bigger. But we're holding it back to a certain amount of work that we want to do on this. So, here we have the assignment specification. So the assignment specification has been out for um, four days? Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday? Five days. Um, sort of four and a half. Uh, so, hopefully, um, people have had a chance to look at it so far. Um, it's split up into an introduction which shows you some of the bits and pieces that you're going to use, um, how to compile it, how to run it, and stuff like that. And then it goes into the actual tasks. You may notice that the amount of text in the tasks is a little bit less than in Assignment 1. We're actually shifting you over to a more kind of 
programmer specific way of thinking about tasks sometimes is that a lot of the time we will do all of our documentation in our H files. Uh, and then we will work in our C files and do all the implementation there. But a lot of the stuff that says what to do is in the H files. You'll see how we're doing it here where stage one and two start off with like diagrams and a lot of text and stuff like that. But if we if we look into stage like stage four and stage five, there's barely a page of text in each of these. And this is really reflecting the difficulty of what we're doing with these stages. Um, this is something I should say, and I, I said it before, I think, on assignment one, is that when we come out of something like high school, high school is usually pitched at a level where if you're in a subject, so if, if you're in a subject and you're, you've been judged at least capable of being in that subject, I don't know how much, they don't usually put hurdles on people to get into subjects, but if you're in that situation, you're usually in a position where you should be able to complete an assignment. So you will do 100% of the work in the assignment, and then you'll get marks based on whether it was all correct or not. So if you did everything and you got it all correct, you get 100%. Um, university assignments are not, not structured the same way. So there is the expectation of the number of people that are gonna get up to stage five, I'm expecting say 20% of the course, roughly. It might be more than that, might be less, but usually on the general marks distribution of Comp 1511, I actually only expect about 20% of the course to even attempt stage five. Um, I consider to, to be a complete and competent computer scientist level of work on this to be somewhere in stage two, or maybe having a look at stage three and stuff like that. But it's not, um, it's not necessary. And if you look at our assessment schemes, like uh, I think we're only asking for stage one and part of stage two to get a passing mark in this. And as they say, P's get degrees. You, you technically only need to pass everything in Comp 1511 for me to have judged that you have everything you need to continue learning computer science. And this is even more so this term, very much more so this term where they there are no marks beyond a pass. Like we're going to give you numerical marks for all these kinds of things. Um, but those are, I guess, from the university's perspective, unofficial. So they're not necessarily going to um, judge you on it because we're in this awkward situation where none of our teaching is face to face. You can't come into the labs. Um, you can't find me to talk to me in person or anything like that. So it's, um, I think the university basically considers that we've made compromises on your education at this point, so we're not going to judge you at a very fine-grained level on that, because the more fine-grained we try to make that judging, the um, the less uh, the less accurate it would be, and the more unfair it would end up. Um, just checking on a couple of things. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, so someone had art asked before about VLab. We're pretty sure VLab will be fine. Um, I think I was questioning it, but Tom's pretty sure it'll be fine. Uh, he actually knows more about the backend infrastructure of how CSE is built than I do. Um, okay, so the stages are going to be similar to the first assignment. So I don't even need to talk too much about the specific stages because it is going to be very similar in that... Um, each of the stages is going to be used again in the stages that follow. So you really want to do them in order and you want to have a certain level of completeness of them in order before you move on to the next. Um, I don't want to go too deep into what's in these right now. So I want to do all the things that you kind of need to get going on the assignment without actually doing any of the assignment for you. So I'm not going to do any coding. If you want coding, go back to yesterday's lecture. It was really heavy on coding and nearly all the code I wrote in yesterday's lecture applies to this assignment in some way. Um, you'll have to fiddle around with it, you'll have to shift it, you'll have to repurpose it for what you need, but the whole point of this is I teach you something and then you show that you can use it. Uh, so that's, I mean, like, you know, that's why we set up the assignment in this way. So let's, let's go back and talk about the setup. So we have supplied some code for you and a lot of what's in this code you nearly 
I wouldn't say it. I wouldn't say you don't need this document that I'm in right now, but a lot of what you need for the assignment is actually in the assignment code that we've given you. So I'm gonna hop over to VLab and, and set this up. So where am I? I'm gonna go to my Comp1511 directory, and I haven't set up any code there, so I'm gonna make a directory. You should probably do the same thing, right? You want a fresh directory. You don't, you don't want all of your files sitting in one directory. I prefer everything to be in separate directories and I can keep things organized. So I'm gonna call it csbeats. I'm gonna go in there. Nothing in there yet, right? Fresh directory. And so to set up the fresh directory, I'm going to come back here and I'm going to say, I can run 1511 set up CS beats with underscores here to copy all the files over to, to um, your CSC account. I suggest this is the best way to get started. Um, two reasons, I will do it and I'll show you why. Um, but if you do want to, you can, um, you can do that manually here. The setup th function just runs all these commands. If you're going to work on your own computer, then you can grab the files um, separately. I think we have a package. Did we have a zip package somewhere for these? Maybe not. Maybe you need to download to TV lab and then copy them over to your own computer. Anyway, let's run that setup. Oops, it's 1511. Okay, it's going to run those commands. As I said before, into the current directory. Oh, the zip isn't in the spec top. Um, did we make one? If we didn't make one, you can always just grab the files from here. So let's have a look at these files now. So in my directory here, I have these files, and I've run 1511 colors. Did we spell it English or American? We spelt, we spelt it a, a British English style. Colors allows me in my term, oops, I didn't want that, I just wanted to do LS again. Here, allows me to see different colors for things. Now, interestingly, only some of these files are editable at the moment. Others are what we call symbolic links, which allow you to see our copy of these files, but not edit them. So the beats.h, main.c, testbeats.h, and testmain.c, these are files that you're not gonna make changes in. You're only gonna make changes in the beats.c file and the testbeats.c file. So the nice thing about this is if you're working purely in VLab, so it's up to you, um, there are other ways to work than purely in VLab, um, but if you are working purely in VLab, if we need to make changes to the assignment to these files, it's unlikely we're going to now because like five days out, we've already kind of picked up on a lot of the little issues. I mean, this is classic, like the first time you release software, there's all these tiny issues. When you get a few hundred people looking at it, you, you find those issues pretty quickly. Um, so we found a lot of those issues, but what's going to happen because these are linked is these will change automatically as we change them. So you'll always have the most up-to-date version of these that you need. Um, it's like getting patches for things automatically. Uh, whereas these ones will be your files that you make changes to. And so they're files that are actually in your folder. These are links to files that are not in your folder, they're in our folders, but you can still use them as if they exist in your folder. So all your compilation and stuff is still going to work. Um, I'm going to show you a trick. If I do gedit star, and it's going to open all of the files. So here I have everything that is in the package that I've been given. So there's a lot of files here. Um, you can think of them as nearly two separate sets. So there's a main.c with a beats.h and a beats.c. Beats.h is a header file. So we've talked about this in uh, multi-file projects. Header file tells you what functions exist, but it does not have any implementations of those functions. It does have a whole lot of information though. So we've pumped this full of information. This is actually what my header files look like when I'm programming professionally, is I have complete documentation in the header file and only a tiny bit of code saying this is the function that this header file was talking about. And so it goes through this whole thing. I didn't write all of this, by the way. Tom wrote heaps of this. Um, but we worked on it together. Uh, and so all of these things are like, this is what I'm intending on implementing. So what I will usually do, if I'm working on a project for like, I don't know, 
there's no working project for like two three months first couple of weeks i won't write any code i will discuss it with the people i'm working with we'll whiteboard it we'll be figuring out exactly what we're doing you don't have to do that because all of the idea of all the whiteboarding and stuff is in the spec um, but when we get from that point to starting to write code i will then spend another week in my h file without writing anything in my c files yet and in my h file i will outline all of these bits and pieces sorry i need to move this so my face is not in the way of all the text yep um, so here I will put all of the information that I think I'm going to need to implement it later. So all of the important ideas that I know need to be in my code, all of the things that I need my functions to do, I'll write all of that stuff down first because it's good to have a plan. I mean, even if the plan's going to change as it goes on, I have a plan. Lucky for you, we set up the plan specifically and we've tested everything that it should do so that you can follow the plan without needing to, to replan part way through. But often we would change stuff in these H files as we're working on things. So when it comes down to it, you can kind of just come through here and go, okay, what does the H file say I'm supposed to do? I can come here to my C file and I can change things. So we have these things like this to do that says you're gonna need to change things here potentially. Um, and then we have extra functions here. Um, places where you should have hash defines if you're going to have constants, places where you should have hash includes, um, the structs, and then in between these, oh yeah, here we go, the stage functions. Here we have all of the things that we think that you're going to need to implement, and each of the names of the functions, the the, the prototype of the functions here matches one of these here. So this beat, create beat, uh, add new to beat, create beat. I think create beat's already been done, yeah, here. So this is an example of one that's already been done and yours, your code will go into each of these functions. And note that the functions themselves say, look, you haven't been implemented yet. So if you were to call this function somewhere or I was to compile to my main, try to call this function, it's gonna say, this has not been implemented yet. So it will remind you which parts of the assignment you've finished and which parts you haven't. Um, <laughs> As Tom's saying, Mark, don't say that we're probably not going to change this again. Um, all software is live. And I, I treat that as an advantage of the fact that we work in software. If I was teaching you a different form of engineering now, let's say civil engineering, and I said to you, after you've finished building a building, you may need to patch it, that would be some kind of gross level of negligence. <laughs> it would be like, you can't just put up a building and have people walk inside it and say it's not finished and we might need to make changes. This is a, a, a major privilege for us in the computing industry is that it's so easy for us to change what we're doing. Um, and it's so easy for us to improve on what we're working on that we have come to rely on it and we're happy to do that. So if any of you use any software that's kind of live, like just like Google Chrome, every, I would say every two or three weeks, you'll see this symbol in the top right corner of Google Chrome, which has a little up, up arrow and it'll be like, oh, we can upgrade stuff. And you'll be like, sweet click a button, it downloads something, upgrades, and it just reopens. And you, you don't even know a lot of the time what's happening. Sometimes it's just background things in, in the browser that's making it better. Um, but we can be really happy in the fact that this constant upkeep is happening in the background. Someone's looking at all of the potential problems in the software and fixing it. So I think it's a, a kind of a beautiful thing to have. Um, because I think that a lot of you may not have, I don't know, I actually don't know how many people in this course are actually older than me or not, but, or, or, the, or similar age to me, but I grew up in a world where software wasn't patched, you know, because the only way we could distribute software was physically. So the internet was not, um, was not available when I was a child. Like, it was, I think it existed, but it was like military and universities were using it and no one else. And so I was a teenager when we actually first joined up to dial up on the internet. And suddenly that opened up this world of um, 
you could actually patch software. So you could go to a website and download a patch for a game and install it and it would actually fix bugs in games and stuff. We take it so for granted now that, that stuff just updates itself in the background and I think that's a really nice thing that we've gotten to now. Anyway, we may or may not patch some of those files. Um, if we do, there will be um, change logs listed in the spec. Um, if there's a change in the file that is major that we need to, um, that actually changes the way those files work, we'll definitely email a notice out if something's big like that. If they're small changes that won't make a difference whether you use them or not, like they're just cosmetic, that kind of thing, then we'll just leave them. Um, is there an issue there. <laughs> so people are picking up issues right now in this. Thank you, demo can. Um, is that a TF2 demo? It's a TF2 demo. That's the class I used to play. Anyway, let's not, let's not. <laughs> Trigger Mark and get him to talk about games again and then we won't learn anything. All right. Um, okay. Tom's dealing with it. So this is a cool thing, right? So people are picking up on issues and you've got your admin right here who is fixing things right now. So that's, that's really handy. Okay. So the structure of the code has two ways that it can be implemented. One is with this main.c. So remember when I said we were doing multi, um, you don't even have to really look in the main. The main's got a whole lot of stuff in it. But when I said that Every C program only has one main file. It means we can compile with, so not main file, main function. We can compile something with one main function. So let me just, actually I should just search for it. Oh yeah, there it is. Did I just scroll past it? I did just scroll past it. Anyway, there was an int main in there somewhere before I scrolled past it. I'm just coming back to the top. No, a little bit laggy. Yeah, so there's my in main there. The interesting thing we have is that it is not the only file that has a main that is in this project. We also have test main.c and it has an int main as well. So there's two ways to compile this project. One is with the main and the other is the test main. So the main itself is the way the project runs as we intend it to run. So when we run it, um, I'll show you the reference solution in a second, it's a similar thing. Uh, it's interactive, we can type in commands and things happen. Um, if I compile it with the test main, it is not interactive, it runs on its own and it tests whether our stuff is working or not. And so this is something that we wanna get people into the idea of doing is that running a separate kind of version of something that links up with the same beats.h and beats.c that the main did, um, we can run automated testing that tells us whether the program is working or not. So whether it's doing all the ins and outs that we think it should be doing, whether all the functions are doing what they should be doing. And it's nice then because if you were testing it in the interactive, something breaks, you don't know which part of it broke because when you're in the interactive version and you ask it to do something, it's linking together multiple different function calls and things like that, and it's harder to tell which one broke. But the test um, program, what it does is it tests each function in its own little individual piece. And when it tests them individually, you can see much more easily whether something broke or not, um, because you'll see exactly which function didn't work. And so we're, we're sort of walking you through the first step in these. I mean, we have, like everything else in this course, sneakily been showing you this the whole time. Because that's what auto test is. Auto test is an idea of what we think the program ought to do. So we have an idea of how the, the program ought to run. And we say, all right, so we need to test these kinds of things. We need to test these kinds of inputs and they should produce these kinds of outputs. We need to test these other kinds of inputs, they produce these other kinds of outputs, you know. Um, this is your chance to actually write some of those tests yourself and have them run in just an easier way as the auto test. The auto test is really quick. It can test your entire program in a couple of seconds. Um, this test main can also do that if you write what you need in it. So there's a testbeats.h and a testbeats.c. 
The testbeats.h has some information on how this testing works and the kinds of things you might want to test. Testbeats.c has space for you to write your own tests in there and it has some examples of how to do the testing. So it's actually pretty simple, you know. You just write something and then it comes out. I actually have that in my list of things to talk about at the end and I've just sort of slid into talking about it at the beginning when I was talking about structures. We'll talk about that more at the end. So the structure is... Uh, Ooh, <laughs> did you just change this? You just changed this. Okay, I'm reloading it there. Uh, <laughs> please close and reopen beats.h. <laughs> right, something changed in there, but we have a change log here. Spelling as pointed out in live stream. So this has been updated in real time while we're doing it, while I'm streaming live. This is just... Welcome to the internet. And this is really funny because, like, if we were doing this in a lecture theater... Actually, if we were doing a lecture theater, I'd still be connected to the internet. We'd still get this kind of update. So uh, this is what I like about doing this, is we can we can do this kind of stuff live. Anyway, the thing I was going to say, there's two ways to compile it. You can compile it with the main, or you compile it with the test main. And so you're going to compile different files, depending on which one you're doing. And... Um, we have some information here about how to compile it. So we can compile the interactive version or we can compile the test version. So if you want to go back and understand exactly what's happening here, you can have a look at my multi-file projects lecture, which is lecture nine, lecture 10, one of those in there. Um, you can always go back through the lecture section and see which one is named multi-file projects. That will give you more information about why these DCC commands are compiling certain files and not other files. So those are the two ways we're going to compile and use things. Um, there's also a reference implementation that can show you the program as it runs. So let's have a quick look at the reference implementation. 1511 CS Beats will run the reference implementation. If at any point you're unsure about what's going on with the reference implementation, which I've, I certainly am, because I've spent so much time looking at it from the back end, not the front end, I definitely have forgotten what the, the typing in commands are to make anything happen. But that's okay, because you can type in a question mark, and the question mark will tell you all the things that um, CS Beats can do. You can look in here, it's like CS Beats, like the CSE, so CSE is in CS Beats. It's not, it's not a typo. The E is there to be CSE. Anyway, little fun things like that. So we can, of course, show the help screen again. We can quit the program if we need to. We can edit beats. So the way this program works is you have one beat that you're working on at a particular time. So this is the beat that we're looking at at the moment. And the beat can have certain notes in it. So basically, if we were to play the music as such, we would play the beats in order, one after the other, and depending on what notes are in the beat, those are the things that would make sound at that particular time. Uh, Tom has just, I think just today, released, um, uh, released the synthesizer, which will actually have this stuff playing in audio if you want it like that. Uh, it's not necessary to use in any way and it's not going to help you with the testing on the assignment. In fact, I should make it clear that there is nothing in this assignment that requires any knowledge of music at all. So you don't, you don't need to, to know music or be able to compose music. You don't even need to listen to music at all to work on this assignment. So this assignment is an abstract assignment based on um, how to use linked lists um, and so we've used the idea of things that can be sequenced in an order, um, and usually they would be separated by time, um, but we're not doing what we would call real-time programming here that has actual timing and stuff like that. So it's still just based on putting together structure of linked lists. So don't worry too much if any of the keywords like octave and note and key and... Um, and things like that are confusing. We've kept them reasonably accurate to to actual music in case anyone here is a musician and looks into this stuff, then, then they still make sense. Um, but if you don't know anything about this stuff, you can treat them as keywords that you're just gonna use.
and, and it's fine. So um, you can treat it as a completely structural exercise and it will still be just as enriching in terms of learning about linked lists. So no background knowledge necessary. I mean, that's like really the kind of, the idea of the entire course is there's no background knowledge necessary. Um, I may talk a lot about things that I think are relatable. Like, you know, I did Dungeons and Dragons, we're talking about Avatar and, um, and like recently Dragon Ball and stuff like that. But I mean, you don't need to know any of those things to understand it. And I brought in some Bon Jovi for fun once. So that's just, that's just me having fun. Cause I like to just, you know, as much as I'm teaching you, I don't want to be like totally serious the whole time. Like if I wanted to, I could teach Comp 1511 and make all the assignments about um, balancing accounting spreadsheets in banking and stuff like that and stuff. And, and you know, some of that might actually be more realistic for some of you, because some of you are going to end up working uh, in the IT arms of major banks and stuff. They're like one of some of the biggest employers in Sydney. Um, but I think for the moment we can, we can get down to the serious stuff later. We can have some fun while we're still learning. Like, you know, a lot of you are at least two or three years away from from doing work work so if if i can get you to learn stuff by making you feel like you're not doing work and you're having fun then um then it's just more fun for all of us all around um <laughs> sorry georgia um i think we're talking about keys as nearly like the individual keys on the keyboard and that would have been would have been notes and so we sort of used up words so yeah it's not entirely accurate um but <laughs> yeah um you would have like to be a fly on the wall so georgia if you were a fly on the wall in our discussions in our meetings as we were putting this assignment together over the last month or so you would have laughed at the amount of time we spent talking about naming of variables versus the amount of time we spent talking about actual educational goals for the assignment. So, <laughs> it was very awkward, it was very awkward. We were trying to be correct for people who knew music while keeping the naming of things simple enough that people could just understand it. So, we apologise that it's not, uh, not exactly the way it ought to be, but hopefully you can still understand the assignment enough to do it. Yeah, there's a long, there's like a 150 message long uh, uh, thread in our Slack, which is our instant messaging, uh, the way we manage the course in the back end, just about note beat and stuff. We were talking about, should beat be beat or should it be time step? But it's not really time because we haven't said how long these things last. And it, just, it went on for ages, um, but we're going to have to live with, we're going to have to live with what we've done now because we published it as it is. Um, yeah, as Don is saying, naming one of the thing, naming things is one of the hardest things in computer science because there's a whole lot of things that we put together and on the spot we just go, okay, it's just like this. And then we, um, afterwards say that was, that was wrong. Now everyone thinks that this is what its name is and we're stuck with it. And we're not sure if that's entirely correct. I met once, I met Tim Berners-Lee who is the, they, they, they call him the person that invented the internet. Um, he didn't necessarily invent the internet, right? It was a lot of people at once working on this. Um, but he put together the protocol for how we do things like web addresses. Um, he's much more significant than just having come up with that protocol. He is one of the most important people for how the modern internet runs today. And, um, in a talk that he gave here, someone asked him this really interesting question. It's like, what would you go back and change if you were going to change something about the way the internet works? And he says one of the things that annoys him the most is uh, URLs, web addresses. Um, Abiram, it's not, it's not that amazing that I met Tim Berners-Lee. He came to UNSW to give a talk um, about four or five years ago. So it was just like, he was here. So obviously I went to see him talk. He brought along an Enigma machine, by the way. He actually has one of the, the German World War II Enigma machines and he was showing it to us. So that was really cool. We obviously weren't allowed to touch it because it's, a, it's an amazing historical 
artifact, so couldn't couldn't put my grubby human oily paws on it, even though I really wanted to. Um, but yeah, yeah. Anyway, so he came and gave us a talk, and like one of the questions asked was like, "What would you do if if you were gonna do it all over again?" And he said that the URL is is wrong. The way we do web addresses is incorrect. So you know, like www dot something dot com. Um, so the dot com is the overall idea of what something is. So it's like the um, commercial entity or educational entity or country. Um, also, dot com dot au, for example, is is country. So you've got the the purpose of it, the country, and before that. So like google.com or something, you have the company itself, the, the company name, and before that you have www, which is World Wide Web, which is actually the computer that you're going to at that company. So at the company Google, if it was a much smaller company, there would be a single computer that answered any of the requests that people made to, to, to look at its web page. There are other things you can do, you can do ftp.something, um, what other ones are there? There's like mail servers use the same addresses. And he said that everything was out of whack because if you go from one end of the address to the other, there's no hierarchy. So what it really should have been was country, purpose within country, company name, computer name, and then the files inside the computer. And if it had been done in that order, then everything would have been a hierarchical kind of thing. So you could get to the right location for something by only reading the first part of the web address. And then every time you go further into the address, you narrow down exactly what you're looking for. And so you have this wide range at the beginning, which is country, then purpose within the country, then the company, then the computer within the company, then the files. And so it would just narrow as he read it. And so he said that it just always annoys him now when he looks at it. And he thinks he didn't organize it very well, but he can't change it now because what do we got like 10 billion computers using the protocol the way, <coughs> the way, excuse me, using the protocol the way that he'd originally invented it. And so that's it. We're stuck with it. So super awkward. Um, and that's why naming things the right way the first time is, is something you do need to put a little bit of thought into. <laughs> Donna, yeah, yeah. Um, and everyone's like, yeah, yeah, that would make more sense, right? And Google owns dot .google now. Okay. I can make, I can see why they would do that. I mean, there's a whole lot of extra words we could use instead of dot .com and dot .org and stuff like that, or dot .gov. <laughs> Thank you, Francis. Um, even though we are in quarantine and stuff, I'm still getting, like affected by pollen and allergies and things. Okay, so I digressed, as I said I was going to, but it's okay, this is a live stream, it's not formal like a lecture, I'm happy to talk about interesting things that might be interesting to people. So I mean, like, every time you look at your variable names and you think maybe I could have named that differently, maybe you should, because you might end up like Tim Berners-Lee and get stuck with it forever. It was like um, yesterday when I was talking about the equals and using the equals in programming to assign a value to a variable. Um, and how I was saying it would be much more useful if that was an arrow to the left instead. Um, <laughs> there's a fight over dot .amazon whether the countries in the Amazon basin should own it, own it or the company Amazon. Well, you know who's going to win that because someone's got all the money. <laughs> oh, well. I don't want to get involved in, in whether Amazon's going to have more power than all of the countries in South America, but I'm pretty sure that in terms of worldwide entities, the company Amazon does have more power than those countries. Um, but, you know... That's a much bigger discussion, which we're not even remotely going to get into. Okay, let's go back to Beats, <laughs> Beats by CSE and have a look at some of the stuff. So we're going to be putting together a beat, and a beat can have multiple notes in it. So our early stages are we can add a note to the current beat, and then we can print out the beat we're constructing. This is going to happen automatically every time we, we, we do anything with the beat. So to do this, we need to know a little bit about what the notes are. So notes have an octave and a note number. 
the way that I kind of like to think about this is it's nearly like the octave is um, a different digit of a number. So if I'm looking at numbers from like 1 to 100, I can look at the tens and I can say there's one ten or there's two tens, there's three tens. You could think of the octaves as the tens and the, um, the, the keys in between those notes as the digits 0 through to 9 in the, in the ones column, so the tens column and the ones column. The only difference here is that there are 12 um, keys in every octave. This would actually be 12, what are we talking about? 12 tones. Now again, this is the naming thing where they're not even tones because there's actually semitones. But then we're getting into too much into musical theory and I don't really want to go into musical theory in a computing assignment, right? I don't want you to have to learn anything about the chromatic scale or anything like that. I know, I can, I can tell I can tell for sure there's the music nerds who are watching right now who are like, yes, we want to get into that. Um, there is so much maths in music. If anyone has studied Bach, um, Bach was a consummate sort of logical mathematician in his composition. Uh, and anyone who's like not even just classical music, anyone who, who plays jazz, I actually played jazz for a long time, um, gets into some really, really deep mathematics when we talk about complex harmonies of things. So there's a, there's a whole lot of weird crossover between music and maths. And you may find if you love music that there's a lot of stuff in terms of um, theoretical computation and um, logical mathematics, which sits really well with your musical brain. Um, a lot of people think that the arts and the technology side of the world are separate. Uh, it's not the case at all. Um, everything that we might study in, in mathematics uh, has some kind of analog in the natural world. The idea of fractal systems as a mathematical equation turn out to be present in nearly all biological systems. Um, growth of trees is really interesting because it follows um, um, it follows uh, mathematical equations for splitting as you split into smaller parts when you split into branches and things. Uh, the spread of a worldwide pandemic and a virus follows nearly exact mathematical models for exponential growth um so all of this kind of stuff and it's like it's interesting because like we often have this kind of disconnect between the real world and what we're doing in this sort of virtual world of cs beats or something like that there's actually a whole lot of stuff going on which is actually really similar in the real world um yeah so tom said one of the demo tracks that he had for the synthesizer he's built for this um is uh um, is a is a bark uh, track. I mean, maybe I'll make some tracks as well for that if I can if I can get around to it. We'll see. It's, all, it's always like it's always fun when the assignments come out. It's like oh, I want to do the assignment as well. I want to do this stuff, and it's like, Mark, if you don't prepare the lecture material, it's much worse than than, than if you don't do the assignment. Anyway, so what we do at the beginning is we add notes to a beat. So each beat can have multiple notes. And this is going to be in a linked list. I think it's time. It's time for me to start drawing things. Okay. So we've got one data structure. Which is a beat. The beat is its own structure. So if I go back here, where would it be? I'm going to assume it's in beats.c because the structures are here. The structure for a beat has notes in it. It has a pointer to one note. So a note structure pointer called notes. This is going to be the pointer to the first element of a linked list. So we're talking about having pointers inside structures. We've seen pointers inside structures to build up a linked list with this next pointer. This is us putting a list inside a struct. It's not inside actually. It's just accessed via that struct. And it's going to look a little bit like this. So I'm going to change the color. And I don't like the color. I'm going to change it to another color that's more obvious to see the difference. And here we have a note. And I can have another note. 
etc. etc. that kind of thing. The cool thing about this is if I was to play this music for example on this beat these notes would happen. So every beat has a certain um, set of notes that might get played but there's also multiple beats. So here's another beat etc. And each of these can have its own notes. So this is the shape of what we are building. I think this is really similar to the, um, the diagram that's in the spec as well, which will be here. Yeah, I did the same across and down the same way. So yeah, so the beats and notes are going to be structured a bit like that. Um, we could use that web app as well. So we've got a little web app here for for the beats. Um, this is how we are sort of adding notes to the structure of the beats. I need to talk about what the note is itself. So let's go back to code. Beats.c has a structure for the note here. Um, this is not set in stone because it's in your C file. This is the C file you can edit. So we do have a comment in here specifically saying you can choose to add or change fields in this struct. So if I wanted to do this differently, um, I could. I wouldn't necessarily go around changing the things that we've given you because if we've given you something, then we had a reasonable idea that this was going to be the most straightforward way to implement this. But I'm not saying you, you don't have to. Like, if you really, really want to, um, you could change this. Um, but if you're unsure of yourself, I would say that is going to add complexity to things you don't necessarily need. Um, but what we're doing here is you have an octave and a key. And we have... Where did we put our information on those? So, octave and a key. So... If we're looking at something like a piano, we could say sections of the piano are different octaves. Um, and then within each octave, there are 12 notes. So I shouldn't call them notes. There's 12 piano keys. See, this is exactly the naming thing going on here. So there's 12 different keys we can press in each octave, and each octave is higher or lower than the other octaves that's on the keyboard. You can already see how this is just a number system. This is just saying there's bunches of numbers that are all strictly higher or lower than each other, and within each of those bunch bunches of numbers, there's a sequence of numbers going from the lowest one to the highest one. Um, I could say the same thing about here's our numbering system, and there are the tens, and each of the tens is in its own separate space on a number line, and within each of those is the numbers 0 through to 9, and they're all different from each other, um, by a less amount than these um, big chunks are from each other. And so with that, we can always tell uh, which note is higher or lower than another note. Um, strangely enough, this is the stuff we put in your tutes and labs this week to give you an idea about how this works. So um, if you're unsure about it, plenty of the tutorials have been recorded this week. I told the tutors also this week to think about maybe going overtime because we've noticed that people are doing the lab work kind of on their own time, but the tutorial work is where people are actually getting together and talking to their tutors. So now that we're not stuck between a room and a lab um, and we have to finish the tute within an hour, we're allowing the tute to kind of stretch on a bit more so that you can actually learn more from the tutorials. Um, Oh no, they're talking about the synthesizer. I'm going to let you two talk about the synthesizer. Okay, so if I want to add a note, my note has an octave and a particular note. I can do that here by A. Um, you'll notice there's um, lowercase and uppercase. Generally, the lowercase is when we're working on an individual beat, and the uppercase is when we're like working on the track, which is the multiple beats. I'm not going to talk about the track yet. We're just going to talk about the notes. So I'm going to add a note to the beat. Octaves are within a certain range, so I'm going to say in the sixth octave, um, note three, 
and then I've added a note. And so the beat that I'm currently editing, it's like kind of like we've got one beat we're editing, and then when we're finishing editing that beat, we can say, okay, add this beat to the track. Stage one has no concept of track. So we're not going to add the track in until stage two. So what we do is we're really starting off with a single linked list. The single linked list is the notes that are in a beat. So I can add another note to this beat. We're being careful with, where, with the way we're adding at the beginning. Um, especially in stage one, the way that we're adding notes is that the first note will be the lowest note that's in that beat, and then any note that we add afterwards is higher than all of the notes that were there before. So if I want to add another note to this now, and I want it to be a legal operation to add another note, it has to be higher. So let's say um, note one in octave seven. I can't remember whether we're starting at zero or one. Hang on. If you need to know these things, you can always look in the spec. Not specifically here, but maybe it's in our files. So what I want to do here is like look at the idea that I didn't necessarily know something. Where would I go to look? I can look in the spec. I can also look in something like the H file. Add note to B. Valid octaves are 0 through to 9, and the valid keys are 0 through to 11. So instead of me just going, oh, the answer to that question is this, I wanted to show you how you want to go looking, over, looking up the answers to questions as you're, as you're um, working on this assignment. So your H file has a lot of information for you. Your spec has some information for you. The spec has less information than the H file. So what we did this time is we tried to shift more of it away from university assignment and into genuine programming. So genuine programming, we tend to document what we're doing in our code. Sometimes we have documentation outside of our code. And it's usually only for reasonably large projects in companies where there's enough time to go off and write web pages about the code that we're writing. And the scary thing is the more we change our code, the more we get to a point sometimes of not changing the websites that are about our code and they get out of date, out of sync with each other and then things get messy. Whereas when all most of our documentation is in the code like this, we're much more likely to have it accurate and correct. And also you can always find it because it's in the code package where you got it. Okay, so I can give, give a zero, but I cannot have a 12 and I can have a zero, but I cannot have a nine. So there's 10 octaves and 12 notes in each octave. So yeah, I can add that note and here, the beat being constructed is showing the beat. Um, I can add a note that's within the same octave, um, so long as it is a different note from the um, the note that's there, and it's higher. So it's got to be like a five would be higher. And so this is slowly building up all of the notes that are going to be played at a certain beat. So at a certain time when that beat is being played, um, these are the notes that would make sound. And so this is the basic construction of the beats. Um, and this is me just doing one of these. So if I just, um, just gonna get rid of all of that, this is what I'm looking at at the moment. I have a beat. The beat is not really part of the linked list itself. It is a separate structure that says, I have access to the linked list. The first node is actually this one. It's nearly like this pointer here coming out of the beat is the head pointer. But instead of the head pointer just sitting in our main as we did previously, the head pointer is coming out of this beat. Um, what else was I going to talk about? Okay, so building up a beat like this. If I go through my stages here, stage one has adding a note to a beat, and it also has um, the ability to count how many notes are in an octave. So if I pick a certain octave and I say how many notes are in that octave, it will look at the beat that I've got at the moment and it will say, all right, um, how many notes have been used in a particular octave in that beat? So we can have a look at this here. So C is the count. And so I've been using stuff in octave six and octave seven here, but if I say count octave five, tell me how many beats are in octave five, there are no notes in octave five. 
sorry, how many beats are in octave 5? There's one beat here. The beat that's currently being constructed, there are no notes in octave 5, and as you can see that here, there's no notes in octave 5. But if I count how many notes are in octave 6, I should say should see that there's one note in octave 6, because octave 6 here has one note. Um, and I can try 7. There are two notes in octave 7. So this, when it comes down to it, this is actually reasonably simple because this is me saying, you have a linked list. The linked list has certain information in it. I want you to go through the linked list and count up how many things have the certain information that I'm looking for. I'm not going to give you any more than that, by the way. I mean, like, you can kind of tell by the question, this is what it's going to be. Um, so you can already start to think if, like, we're going through these stages one by one and doing these things, what kind of things is, is, is the assignment asking us to do? So one of them is add things to a linked list. And we said everything's going to be larger than the one before it, which means the only thing we're asking you to do is add something at the very end of a linked list. So we're asking you to be able to find the end of a linked list and then add a node onto the end of a linked list. And then the count the beats says we want you to loop through the whole linked list and count up how many of certain things are there. Um, we have definitely looped through linked lists in the lectures. We've definitely counted up how many things were the same in arrays and stuff. And so it's a matter of just piecing those things together and seeing whether you can get this code to work like that. Um, I'm not necessarily going to go through everything in all of the stages. Oh, sorry, I, I was going to use this. This is this cool thing that, um, that Tom put together for the assignment where we can interactively build a linked list of notes like this. So if I build the same one that I had there, I think it was a 6, note 3, and I add that, this adds this note here. Um, you don't necessarily need to know what these addresses are, but it's nice to know that these pointers here, this pointer equals this address, which is the address of this note here. Um, people are talking about... Oh, people are talking about the synthesizer. Right, I'm just gonna I'm gonna let that conversation happen there. <laughs> um, and if I want to add another note, it has to be a higher octave than the one that's here. So let's see if I try to add a note in octave five. Um, this nice interactive thing says no, we can't do that. Um, this is not higher than the highest octave, and it's not higher than the highest um, key that we have at the moment. So even though it's the legal octave, we can't add this note. See, I can clicking add note and nothing's happening. So this interactive thing allows us to see which ones are valid for adding, and then if they are valid, whether they will work here. So if I change this to a seven, these go green, and it's like, okay, you can do that. So we can add another note here. Um, and so you can play around with this thing, and it'll tell you whether things are, are valid or not. So if I try to add something octave 99, this thing says, no, the octave is not less than 10. So you can't add that note, that's an invalid octave. This will help you just sort of interactively play around with this and say, okay, what are the limits I need to check on for allowing someone to add a note or not? And this structure just shows you how the notes become a linked list. So we have the beat structure it points at the first node. Um, first note, it's a node, note node. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then how they all link together like that. So this is this a nice little tool that you can play around with if you need to. Um, as we go further into the stages, um, we are going to add in stage two the idea of a track. So the track then um, gives us the capability to um, chain beats together. So if I come here to my beats, let me just move this a little down here. Um, oops, I need a brush. Yes. Here is a track.
the track, I think, I'm not sure if we actually have the track in our beats.c. So, we have a track here in the beats.c. We have listed this explicitly to say you are going to need add to add things to this. So there's, there's stuff missing in this to begin with. So the first thing is there's a beat pointer. So a pointer to a struct beat pointer points to one beat and that's the head of the list of beats. This is going to give us access to the first beat in a list of beats and the beats are actually had um, deleted that before, unfortunately, but I'll just say, yeah, that's going to continue off the screen there. Oh, actually, I can, I can still draw the bottom of this one. All right. So there's a list of beats going there. Each of the beats, I'm not going to draw them all because it could be lots of them, could have lots of notes in it. So what we're looking at here now is the ability for linked lists to go into this kind of a two-dimensional state but it's not as sort of mechanically exact as the two-dimensional grid so the two-dimensional grid was going to make a square two-dimensional grid of arrays was going to make a square this is not really like that this is a list and each element of this list has a list coming off it but each of these lists could be a different length so we could have a list that had um, we could have a beat that didn't have any notes in it, and that's fine. Minesweeper would never allow us to do that. It's really fixed. It's like, now nah, all these arrays have got to be the same if you're going to make a 2D array. Um, but we're now working with what could be considered a more powerful data structure, the linked lists, which are capable of changing to lots of different things. So we could have a beat with null. We could have a beat down here with... say three notes in it that kind of thing so it won't always be the same thing so the track is then going to be the thing that says I know where the first beat is the beat knows where its first note is and where its next beat is and we could go through this and if we wanted to like play this music for example you say okay on beat one these notes make sound then on beat two nothing Beat three, these notes make sound, that kind of thing. So the track is what we think of as like starting to put together um, the piece of music, I guess. Like we're, we're still pretty simple at the moment in what we're doing. We're not about to make a serious like piece of music out of this. This would be a really fiddly way to do it. But still, we're building up the idea. Um, as we go into the track, we also start to think of the idea of where the track is. So it's nearly like we're playing the track and it's going through the beats one at a time. Um, so we can keep track of where we are, like what's the current um, beat in the track that's, that's currently being played. So I could do that if I wanted to by... maintaining... A, a pointer to one of the beats. Um, there's different ways to do this. I don't really want to say too much about this because I don't want to say that this is the way that you have to implement it. But it's it's a reasonable idea. We can say the track knows which beat it is currently thinking about. So it could be a pointer to a beat or it could just be like some other way, like the number of the beat that you're, that you're on and um, you have some way of knowing which number each of these things is by like looping through and seeing how far in they are, that kind of thing. Um, but I think the pointer is probably going to be the most obvious way to do this. Um, Alright, lots of, lots of talking there, but we've got um, Tom and Donna here at the moment who are so Tom's the admin, as you know, Don is one of the tutors, so you've got a lot of people answering the questions there. But what I wanted to show is this kind of structure. So a fully fledged um, CS Beats implementation will end up with this kind of structure. Um, you don't actually even need the track to 
I think we don't need the track to pass, or we actually will have some parts of the track at least if we're if we're getting a passing mark for this assignment. But as it gets more complex, we add more stuff like this to it. Um, so this kind of diagram is is the thing that I think we need the most in terms of knowing how to make this assignment. So we know that we're making these linked lists of notes and we know that we're making these linked lists of beats. Each beat has a pointer to one, one linked list of notes. Um, and so that way we have this idea that you can play multiple notes during a beat and the, the beats itself are chained together in order. And then we have a track which is a separate structure. The track is not a linked list. The track is just a structure that says, I know where the first beat is. So it'll have a pointer to the first beat, and it'll also say, I know where I am currently in the list of beats. Um, potentially a pointer to the beat where you are at now. And then we start adding functions. I'm not, I'm not even gonna talk about the stuff beyond this stage because it's all sort of extra stuff that you can do if you want to. Um, so we can do things like, how do we potentially play this track? And so we've actually got, um, I haven't built up enough here, but if I go back and open the menu, there's a, actually a play, like, I don't know, it's pretty old school, but the arrow across to the right is the play from old tape decks and things like that. I mean, it still is the button on, like, YouTube and stuff like that to play. So all this does is says, move the currently selected to the next beat. I should do that vertically because the diagram is vertical. So if the current is this beat and I press the play button, the current moves to the next beat. And so a track can be in play where the current pointer is moving between the beats, but the current pointer can also, I'm already calling it a current pointer. <laughs> I'm giving away stuff about the assignment. I apologize. You can use a pointer, but there are other ways to do this if you want. Um, I mean, I guess we were already very much insinuating that this was going to be a pointer here. But yeah, so the currently selected beat will change um, every time you press the play button. And a track can be playing or stopped at any particular time. So if this current pointer was not aimed at any of the beats, then we would say that the track is stopped. Um, and then it will move through these as we play the track. So it will always like start on the first one and then move through them. Um, but we can also just sort of set our currently selected to a certain point in our track. Am I, am I doing this right, Tom? Can't specifically determine what the last beat is. Oh, no, no, no you're answering different questions there. That's fine. <laughs> cool. All right. So our structure is going to be a bit like this. And so we're going to have the ability to move through our track by moving between the beats. And if we wanted to, we could say, okay, at any beat that we're at at the moment, let's look at the notes that are in that beat. So we're learning a lot about linked lists here. First, we're building linked lists by adding notes onto the end. And then we're building another linked list where each one of these has a pointer to a list of notes. And so the the, the basic functionality of, of working with this assignment is just one linked list, and then as we get into stage two, we add the second linked list. But each time we have a linked list, as opposed to previously where we just had a pointer as the linked list, now every linked list has a another struct which manages it. So the beat manages the list of notes, the track manages the list of beats. So we've put these extra structures in place so that we can have some more information about what's happening in a particular note, that kind of thing. Um, where are we? I have a list of things I wanted to talk about. So like I was looking at the spec, setting up the code, we've done that. Structure of the linked lists, we've covered that now. Um, some diagrams of the notes, the the list of the notes um, and the list of the beats. So I'm just looking at my, my, my notes to see what I was going to talk about. Um, I also have a note here about using H files to suggest what you should do in the C files. And I think I've already talked about that where everything that we're going to do in our C files will have been documented in our H files. So there's like, if you look at this, there's probably for some of these, there's more text here 
than there is in the assignment spec document itself. So this is us trying to shift you towards using these um, instead of necessarily needing these. However, if you do need these, definitely, definitely use them, right? Because the diagrams help a lot in understanding exactly what's going on. Um, we've also talked about testing by compiling differently. Um, I don't, I'm not going to go through it now, but if you want to, you can start running the auto tests uh, for particular stages, and the auto tests of those particular stages will not just compile your main.c and run it that way. They will also compile your test main.c, and and the auto tests will check whether you've written tests or not. So they'll test whether um, the um, the tests you've written here in test.c are, are testing certain things that are happening in um, uh, in kind of dummy um, beats implementations that we have. So we've done some dummy implementations that may or may not do things correctly and we'll see whether you're being able to check whether they do or don't um, meet the specification properly. So this stuff is interesting and I think in terms of learning what to do with the testing, it's a matter of looking at what the tests here already do and saying, okay, I'm going to use a similar kind of thing. So this is like, if we tried to add a beat that was invalid, then this thing should tell us that it's an invalid octave. So add note to beat should return something. So add note to beat, add note to beat here. should return not highest note, or should return, okay, should return one of the following things. Invalid octave, invalid key, not highest note, or valid note. So this is us saying that when you run the add note to beat function, it should return an integer, but what that integer is is actually a return code of whether, whether it was successful or not. So these are the reasons why it might not be successful. So I tried to input something that was incorrect. These are the things that should tell me. It should say, this is why I cannot add this note to the beat. Otherwise, it will say, I did add this note to the beat and it was valid. So the cool thing about this is now when you do your testing, you can say, this kind of test should fail in this way. So I should have gotten this kind of failure. So we have done one example here of a couple of failures. So these are invalid octave fail failures, and this is an invalid key failure. And then we can return here and define that we said, this program does not meet the spec because when we tried to add an invalid note, it didn't necessarily give us the correct answer for how it was invalid. One thing that's super interesting about this, and I haven't talked about assessment yet, but I'm going to talk about assessment. That's going to be the last thing I'm going to talk about. You don't have to be able to write the code for stages, say, four and five, to be able to get the marks for the testing for it. If you have an understanding of what things should and shouldn't output based on the inputs you give them, you can actually earn marks for those stages without implementing those stages at all. So I think when we did our chat, uh, well, when I did my lecture on testing, I talked about the idea of people who were QA engineers, a, a full profession for people who may not know how to write the code themselves, but they know how it should function and how they might want to break it. So they come to your code and they go, look, I'm going to break your code. And instead of saying, oh my god, please don't break my code for me, what we usually say to them is like, oh, thank you so much. Because I've done some testing, but I'm not really sure whether this thing's going to work. And I really don't want this, this thing to fail for the, with the public. I'd prefer it failed within our company before it goes out into the world. And we get our QA engineers to come in and go, yeah, okay. I will find out everything that can go wrong in this thing. And so it's actually interesting. So there's a certain percentage of the assignment that can be earned in the testbeats.c file, which you can do without understanding how to write the code for the other parts. All you need to do is know what kinds of inputs and outputs this thing should deliver and test 
whether it does or doesn't deliver those inputs and outputs. So this is an interesting kind of thing. It's an interesting way of looking at things. Um, uh, because it's like a super important part of what we're doing in programming. For the moment, with 1511, this thing's only worth 10% of the assignment. Um, in reality, testing is worth a lot more than 10% of any project that we do. Um, but for the moment, because this is not something that we've spent a huge amount of the course on, we've only spent one lecture on it, um, this is something that uh, is worth looking into, um, it's worth learning about, but we didn't want to really make it the, f the focus of the assignment, because I think at this point in your learning about programming, what you want to learn about is just how to make things work. But also, making things work is also having the understanding that we don't know if things work or not until we've tested them. Um, <laughs> Georgia, that's pretty funny. Your mom's capable of breaking any piece of technology you give her. Yeah, <laughs> that happens. There are some people that do that. Um, I used to have a friend who I was actually did university with at UNSW with, um, and <laughs> our nickname for him was Hardware Failure Boy, because. <laughs> We would get together for LAN parties, so this was back in the day, like someone would have a network switch, we'd all go, go together to someone's house and plug all our computers together and play games. And he would spend the whole time just trying to figure out why his computer couldn't connect to the network and why the games wouldn't run and stuff. And so we'd be there for like a whole weekend playing games and this one guy would just be like, my computer won't connect to the network and all this kind of stuff and so everything. Yeah, it was always really funny. Um, I think he would probably be a great QA engineer um, because he'd just touch your things and then find the point where they break because every piece of software has something that we haven't thought of because it's hard to think of every possible input you know and so you're going to get in those situations um, if I was going to give someone an unlimited amount of time to work on an assignment like this and I knew that they were very good at understanding the spec and working with it, what I would say to them is I would say complete testbeats.c first. Um, get testbeats.c to the point where it's really, really complete and it tests everything you need to test and then only after you've done that do you go across to beats.c and start editing things over here. Because what you will have is you will have set up this whole framework for yourself that you can tell exactly whether your other code is working or not in a really quick and automated fashion and you don't have to type anything in to test you just compile against test.c and run it and it'll tell you which bits of it work and which bits of it don't so it's kind of like you don't need auto tests if you've written a good test beats.c um, at the moment we're still giving you auto tests but imagine that for those auto tests, this is what someone like Tom does for the course, is that Tom has written every, like a whole complete implementation of testbeats.c in a sense. And that's what the auto tests are. They just throw all these things at you and tell you whether you had the right answer or not. Um, in general, with software we're making in the real world, we don't have auto tests. Because if we had these auto tests, that would mean that someone already knew what the answers were going to be. And when we're making real software, we don't know the answers before we've written the software. Um, if we knew the answers before we'd written the software, there wouldn't be a reason to write it. Your reason for writing stuff now is because you're learning about it, as opposed to trying to get an effective piece of software finished. So if we're trying to do that, then we would have to write our own tests. And so what we're trying to do is get you towards the idea that this is how we do things um, in, in the real industry, is we write our tests and we make sure our tests are checking all the different pieces of our program to make sure they're all working. Um, if you want to look up a, a theory on this kind of stuff, um, it's often called unit testing. Because what we do is we break everything into individual units and test them individually. And if any one of them break, we know that that unit is broken and then we need to work around it and we know which bits work and which bits don't and this is the bit we need to fix. Fix. So you note that each one of these tests is only testing one function at a time. It is not testing whether the whole thing works 
whether other parts are working or not. It's just testing whether one function does exactly what it's supposed to do or not. And that way we can separate our code into pieces, into these units, uh, and then we can see whether each of these things is working or not. Um, okay. Other things I was going to talk about. So I've, I've been going back and forth on what we're talking about here. So I said that we can earn a lot of marks in testing. So 10% of the assignment is in testing. And so you can do that part of the assignment without writing a single line of code in the beats.c file. So you can get 10% of the marks for the assignment via that if you want to. But let's jump back into assessment here. I guess before I go deep into it, I want to remind you of the level of collaborative work that we're okay with or not okay with um, in this assignment. So we want each of you to be able to get through this assignment spoiler free. So the more that we talk about this assignment with other people, the more we spoil it for other people. And the whole point of learning is that we're going through a journey uh, where we will build up our understanding of how to how to do something. So our understanding of linked lists is built by us going on the journey of this assignment, going from the beginning to later on. If someone tells you exactly how to implement stage one, they kind of break your journey, and then you end up in a position where you don't learn as much because you already knew what the destination was, and then all you need to do is sort of fill out the stuff to get there. Whereas if you're wandering kind of lost and trying to find your way to the destination, then you really know the way there. So it's actually better not to get help in certain regards. I mean, sometimes it's good to get help, right? You want to go to help sessions and stuff like that when you're like, this doesn't compile and I don't know why. <laughs> it's like, we'll have a look at, at it with you and go, there's actually just a typo there. Your logic is correct. But if someone gives you the logic for the assignment, and then all you do is take the logic for the assignment and translate it into code, it's kind of like, yeah, you'll learn a little bit. You'll learn a little bit about writing the syntax of code and stuff like that. Or you'll learn how to solve that one problem. But you won't necessarily learn how to solve the next problem that you see later. So where I think is a good place to draw the line is you can talk about concepts. So everything in the lectures you can talk about. You can talk about looping through lists. You can talk about um, adding and removing from lists, moving the pointers around, that kind of thing. Um, but the, when you start talking about um, beats and notes and tracks and specific commands and what they do, what you're doing then is basically giving away spoilers and it's going to make it harder for someone to actually get the learning that they need out of the assignment. And the irony is everyone's like, oh, I want to do as much of the assignment as I can. Um, and yes, if you, if you ask everyone else how to do it, you will technically have completed more of the assignment than you would have otherwise, but you'll have learnt less from it. Um, and especially in this situation where we're only on a pass-fail for this subject, I would, in this situation, be wanting to learn the most that I could out of this subject because it doesn't matter what mark I'm getting in the subject. So I don't need to get help from other people to boost my mark as high as I can. What I'm really looking for is to boost my capabilities so that next term, when the WAM comes back in, or the term after, I don't know how long we're going to be in quarantine, but at some point, when the WAM comes back in, I am like totally like, you know, I've got all the knowledge I need to be able to do that really well. So I've learnt deep at these times when the pressure's off, um, so that later on when the pressure comes on, I can perform at a really high level. So I think that's probably a good way to think about these things now. It's really weird, right? Because I, I usually would never be talking about it like this. Because this is like a meta discussion about like maximizing your score at university. I don't know if I need to say this. I think everyone knows this, but I'm going to say it anyway. The score you get at university is is useful in some ways as a measure of how you're going, and it's also absolute bullshit in other ways. In that it's this weird number. They give you a number for how well you're doing, and um, and you hope that that number is some measurement of how you're going. Some companies will look at these numbers when they're hiring you, other companies will ask you to demonstrate your ability. Um, if you can't demonstrate your ability and you have really high numbers, they will know that you are lying. 
and they'll know that somehow you got away with cheating and it's a real mess right and and even if not even if like you do get hired into into a company eventually your actual ability to do things is going to come through so this is go back to my professionalism lecture there's a lot of stuff about this there if your focus is on learning as much as you can um rather than right here and now getting the maximum marks for this assignment if your if your focus is on the long term your success is going to be in the long term um, so you're going to be able to do things for, for in a career that you enjoy for a, for a long time as opposed to just getting good marks right now and doing it in a way that you're not proud of so <laughs> that's my version of don't cheat uh, and I think it's a little bit different from a lot of I've, I've heard from other lecturers I've heard some classic things from other lecturers um, and, and sometimes I feel like I should say this because what I try to do is I try to, to tell, tell people why cheating is not actually going to help them it's not going to, to make you smarter um, it's actually going to keep you dumber so so that's that's one thing that sucks I mean, I've seen other lecturers also say to people don't cheat because we have very very sophisticated technology to find out whether you've been cheating or not and when we do find people that's cheating a lot of us as educators tend to take it personally and we tend to fail you the hell out of our course because you screwed with us so <laughs> that can happen <laughs> I can't say I'm entirely immune to that because I've had people who I've, I've found they've obviously cheated and stuff and then they tried to lie to me about the fact that they were cheating and then I'm just like, I get really angry. Um, but I think from your perspective, that's not important whether I'm going to get angry at you or not. Um, from your perspective, it's like, what value can I get out of this course um, and what can I learn that's going to put me in a good place later on in university and later on in my working career? Um, and I think if you've got that kind of focus... Um, you'll be fine, you know? I don't know if I really need to say this that much, but I do think it's important to think about. So anyway, before we talk about assessment, I'm talking about um, uh, the idea that it's not a valid assessment if you didn't do it yourself. Um, and so whatever marks you get doesn't mean anything if you just copied the work from someone else. Um, or worse, you paid someone else to do your assignment for you. I just like, it's like, okay, if, if, if what you're intending on doing in the future is being a manager of a company, the owner of a company who pays other people to do work, yeah, that's, that's, that's a, a completely valid profession, right? There's a, there's a lot of people doing that. Um, but here and now we're teaching you about the fundamentals of learning how to program, which is not the same as doing management. So um, please don't pay other people to do your assignments. It's just such a hugely unethical thing to do. So it's just, it's such a mess if you do that. Um, anyway, let's get on to what is actually going on in the assignment in terms of assessment. So, this assignment is worth 25% of your final mark. Note that originally we said this assignment was worth 20% of your final mark and we bumped it up a bit because the final exam is a 24 hour take home exam which is like, it's nearly like another assignment but it's a short one where it's just these short specific questions. This assignment we put a lot more work into and um, you're gonna put a lot more work into this because you've got a lot more time to do it and you're gonna learn more from the assignment than you are from the exam. The exam's just for us to go, this person crossed the line, you know? This person learnt what we taught them. Whereas the assignment is not about us, it's not necessarily about us saying, this person can or can't do linked lists. This is your chance to learn them in a practical way. Um, so we thought we'd put more marks into the assignments. Originally it was 20%, now it's worth 25%. The exam used to be 50% because that was like the point where it's like, no, you can't pass the course unless you get marks in the exam. Um, now the exam's worth a little bit less, but it still has hurdles in it. So we still, even if you've got 100% in everything, you got 55% in the course, you still need to prove in the exam that you can do the basics that we expect people to do, basic competency levels. We're gonna talk about that later. Exam is something for a discussion for a later day. Um, 
But let's look at the assessment scheme for the assignment itself. So it is now worth 25% of the course instead of 20% of the course. I did want to bump up assignment one as well, but us realizing we were going online happened during assignment one. If it had happened before the start of assignment one, I would have been okay with changing the marks value of it, but I felt it would be unfair to change the marks value of it after some people had started and some people hadn't. You know, so it's just not really something I wanted to do in the middle of it. But assignment two, I could change that before we started it. So it bumped up to 25%. So 70% of the marks are the performance of the functions you write in beats.c. So this is the standard functionality of the assignment. How many of these stages were you able to complete? At what level of success were you able to write the functions in the stages, right? So I think you know this already. This is the same way your labs are being marked, the same way a lot of assignment one was marked. 10% of the marks come from testbeats.c. We have auto tests for that as well. So you can test some of how well your tests are going. Um, not all, but some you may want to think about doing it in a more compre comprehensive way or not, depending on what kind of marks you're shooting for. 20% um, of the marks for the assignment will be style again. Um, by, I don't know, I'm thinking maybe Tuesday next week. Tuesday's the first working day next week. By Tuesday next week, I would say the majority of you, except for anyone who needed extensions and things like that, those will be marked later. But before that, the majority of people who have um, done the assignment uh, will have gotten feedback about style. So functions were really new to us in the first assignment. So you may, a lot of people may have got feedback about how they could use functions better. You can put that into practice in the second assignment, um, especially because most of the second assignments already separated into functions for you, but if you need to separate it further, you can still do that. Um, again, the difference between uh, a high distinction and a normal distinction could just be in the style marks. Um, so, in a sense, the style marks are worth more than stages four and five put together, and the testing marks are worth as much as an entire stage as well. So. We don't take these things lightly, we think they're quite important. Um, if someone handed in an assignment that completed everything that we'd ask for uh, functionally from the assignment and it was all written on a single line of C, this is technically possible by the way, you just never press the enter key, you can just do one single line of C. It's just one massive long single line. Yeah, sure, it passed the tests, but it is completely useless code because there's no way we can make effective modifications to it, there's no way we can read it, there's no way we could pass it to someone else and have them reuse it for something else. So that's the kind of thing where it's like, we really, really don't want that happening. Um, that's an extreme example. But what we're looking for is things that are a, a examples that are less extreme, but are still differences in how useful a piece of code is. So how useful something is, is not necessarily how well it passes auto tests or how well it um, completes the functions we've asked it to complete, but it's how useful it might be if we were to add new functions to it. Is it set up in a way that can, it can accept new functions? Is it set up in a way that if I wanted to change some of the fundamental nature of the assignment um, or the functionality of the program, could I do that with a minimal amount of effort? Um, if I was to give it to someone else and say, I want you to now make version two of this, would it be readable enough that we could go through it and say, yeah, I can make changes to this easy. I can see clearly where this thing's going. It's been documented well enough that I fully understand what's happening. So those are the kinds of things that are important. I probably don't need to tell you about style again, but I think it's worth it. Um, I may be preaching to the choir here because I know that we've got a small number of people um, uh, in here at the moment, so it's probably the keen beans here who are all actually um, going to be writing the style the best they can, uh, is the people that are here now, but we'll see how it is. Um, Tom's pinging me about, might want to mention that the testing auto tests aren't required. Oh, okay, okay. So we have some auto tests um, for, for the tests Dot C. If you have a comprehensive set of tests, like a good set of tests that aren't exactly the same as what we auto test, you, you can still get full marks for that. So if you believe your tests are a good way of testing the whole spec, um, 
then we will probably accept that it is as well. Um, uh, so you don't have to match the auto tests exactly in the testing files. The auto tests for the testing files are examples for us to help you along your way um, because you know that everyone's used to testing with auto tests. So it's a bit weird, right? So we're asking you to write auto tests and we have auto tests that test your auto tests. Um, so it's getting a bit meta by that point, but we thought we'd throw them in to at least help you with those rather than just saying, implement these tests with no feedback as to whether they're working or not. So up to you how they work. The gradations of how we're doing these things. So I've talked a bit about what's going to happen if um, if you work with other people or you copy from other people or you pay someone else to do it. There are certain things where if you have paid someone else to do it or you have stolen work from someone else and submitted it, you're more, li more than likely going to fail the entire course. So if that happens, that's not something that we like at all, um, because that's you taking advantage of other people in certain ways, and that's you nearly intentionally lying about your capabilities. Um, which I mean, like it's just you kind of lying to yourself at that point. So there's, the, there's no value in doing that. So these are the points where we might say, yeah, we're actually going to remove you from the course entirely. But there are other things where we might just give you zero marks for the assignment itself and that's if you're collaborating with other people you're sharing things with other people or you've worked with someone else on this and you both submit the same code um, and I understand that's the way we're doing labs and we do want to teach you how to work with other people but when we're working on the assignments it becomes individual so we want these assignments to be done individual as opposed to the labs where we want you sharing code with each other code reviewing each other and learning from each other so there's a bit of a line that we draw here and we assess these things differently so in terms of like honest attempts at um, at CS Beats if you haven't managed to complete stage one but you've had a good crack at it um, you you've tried to understand it and you've tried to get a few things working and not everything's working we're still going to have a look at these we'll look at these by hand if they fail a lot of auto tests we'll still look at them and we're still going to give you a mark close to 50 if you've got it partially working and you've you've made a solid attempt at it and you showed that you tried to understand it but maybe hadn't understood it fully so that's the kind of thing where we say look with a bit more learning you'll get there it's not going to be that hard you've got a few weeks to work on the basics before the exam you can still quite easily pass the course we give you enough marks to get close to 50. Um, so that's for for people who are struggling at the moment and um, and having issues you can still get the knowledge that you need out of this you can still go on the journey that the assignment takes you on without necessarily going all the way through it you can still learn important things so the passing mark is if stage one is complete so if you are able to work with a single linked list which is the linked list of notes you can add things to it and you can loop through it and count things in it i think those are the only two things in stage one i can't remember exactly but yeah fully working stage one with some tests um, you will end up adding up to about 50. So that means that you won't need to do that many tests for this. But if you wanted to boost this to a higher thing and get closer to credit, you could do a lot of tests. So if you find that your focus is more on the testing than it is on the implementation of code, yeah, you can work like that if you want. Credit is stages one and two. So this is reasonably similar to how we did assignment one. The only difference with um, assignment two here is it's bigger. So assignment one was worth 15%, this is worth 25%. So there's more work to do. It's still only three weeks, but there's a little bit more work to do. So you can think about um, how long you spent on assignment one and, and where you finished. If you want to get the same mark, maybe you want to spend maybe 20, 30% more time. So you want to start a little bit earlier on assignment two. Or if you did spend the whole time on it and you want to improve your marks, you can think about going to more help sessions, um, spending the time in your, your allotted lab time to talk to your tutor about things. The tutors are available for talking in lab time like that as well. Um, if you want to get more of an understanding of the concepts um, for, the, um, uh, for the assignment. So as we go in, the more stages you implement, the... Um, 
the more marks you're going to get. But it's not just the, implemented, the implementation of stages. You note that we're also talking about how much the test suite covers for all of the functionality of the assignment. So if we were going to do this in a really rough sense, we would say if the tests only cover the stages you've implemented, then this is the rough scale of marks. You can push yourself into a higher bracket by covering things that you haven't implemented with your tests. So if I'm down here in a, in a, in a credit um, and I've done the tests that um, are relevant for stages one and two, I could get this up to mid 70s if I did tests for stages three, four and five as well. I might even be able to get into a distinction if I'm testing stages three, four and five and my style is really good, I might end up at a higher level even though I've only implemented the functionality for some of the stages. So this isn't exact, it kind of is malleable. And conversely, you could have completed stages one to five with some really god awful C. Um, if, if it's really god awful, then your mark will be capped down here, uh, or down here at a distinction because 20% of the marks are for style. So careful of those things, we want to teach you to be consistent. So we want to teach you not just to, to, to implement functionality, but also to be testing your functionality properly and um, structuring your code and commenting your code in a way that people can understand it. Um, we would love everyone to come out of this course as holistic programmers where there's, you don't think that there's a specialty yet for you. So we, we don't want I mean, like, you can if you really want to, but I, I don't necessarily want people to come out of this course and say, oh, I'm a, I'm a linked list programmer. Like, I just work on linked lists and I never use arrays. You know, it's like, it's like that's not, that doesn't even make sense, by the way. <laughs> but, you know, like, people much later on in their studies will start to specialize into certain things. Like, me personally, I spend a lot of time on things like human interface design for, for stuff like games. Uh, artificial intelligence at a high level algorithm kind of thing. So I'm not really that good at coding them, but I'm good at the whiteboard section of it, right? And so I have these specialties because after about 10, 15 years of working, so I've been in computing industry for like, we're talking like 20 years now, um, you end up going further and deeper into particular things and you end up with specialties because your practice in other things drops by the wayside but when we're talking first year computing I, I would love everyone to at this point still be looking at all the possibilities for what they can do because you haven't gone so deep into something yet that something's dropped by the wayside so if everyone gets a breadth of knowledge in 1511 it's better than being really good at just one part of it um, so that's why a full HD a full marks HD has working functionality it has code that's so clean that I would be happy to teach with it you know so it's just clean and well laid out and easy to understand and it tests everything that it implemented so that's the way that we want uh, like a full mark student to be and that's the you know that's the kind of aspirations that we should all have is that our code works well um, it's easy to understand and we're sure that it works well because we put our tests together to make it work. Um, oh, Tom's also saying there's no tests for stage five. Um, I can't remember what stage five is. <laughs> I know that there's like stuff in stage four and five. Right, this is the cut and paste stuff. It's very much harder to test these things. Um, so these are the kinds of things that there's such complex functions that we might end up testing these manually rather than an automated testing system. Okay, I'm nearly dead on two hours, so I nearly have time to this right. Um, does anyone have any final questions before I wrap up? I have said everything on my little agenda here that I said I was going to work on, so... Um, I think this is all the information I wanted to give you, which should give people enough information to think about how to get started on the assignment. Your tutorials this week, your tutorials and labs this week are very, very good to do to learn about how to get started on the assignment. I think they're all over now, 
there's one going at the same time as this. I apologize to everyone who's in that lab right now, but obviously this is recorded, so you can go back and watch it later. Um, does anyone have any further questions they would like to ask? Please put them in chat now. I'm kind of assuming that most of the questions that have been asked have been happening while I've been talking, and Tom has been answering all of them, because I can see his name popping up a fair bit there. So, um, we'll see if you, if you need to ask any more questions. Otherwise, we can wrap it up. So, um, uh, Pelon Lee is asking about how should we generate good test data? So this is always a, a, an interesting and difficult uh, question to answer. So what I think about when I am writing stuff like tests for something like this um, is what are the possible inputs? So if we look at something, one of these initial ones, like adding a note to a beat. So a note can be added to a beat at the end of the list and only certain notes can be added to the beat. So if we look at our interactive thing here, I'm going to clear the beat. There are certain octaves and notes that work. They all come up green here. So what I might want to do if I was going to test this, I want to think about all the places where this could be invalid and all the different ways that it could be invalid. So one invalid thing is I give an octave that is an incorrect number, so it's too low. So that's definitely one test I want to do. This is test. This is a test that's already in the file, so you'll see this test there. There's an octave too high, so maybe I have an issue with that as well. Um, we can have keys that are also too high and too low. I need an octave before this will test. Um, and then when we go into more complex things, I might want to add more than one note in a sequence. So let's say I add this valid note, and then the validity of the note of the next note changes because there's already a note there saying that I can't add a note that's lower than it. So there's already several things that I could test there to make sure that my program is working correctly. So I want to test ranges of these values that are correct or incorrect, and then once the situation is set up in a certain way, those ranges change. I want to make sure that my program is tracking that as well, so I'll test the ranges. Now that I've got a note, I'll test the octave ranges as well, and I won't necessarily get the right octaves depending on what um, what numbers I put in here. Certain things that used to be valid if they were the first note are no longer valid, so that's another thing that I might test. So as you go through, you will see information in the stages and also in the H file, a lot of information in the H file about what is valid and invalid. And then you'll be like, all right, let's check for everything that's valid and invalid. And then we'll see if we can get some, some useful testing out of that. So that way we can get, um, we can then run our program against the tests and it'll tell us whether we've done things valid or not. Yeah, and as Tom is saying there, if we want to, we can test multiple beats. So if you want to, you can make a beat, put some stuff in it, test a certain situation, and then you can just wipe that beat, start a new beat, and say, okay, now we're going to start this new one, and we test it with a certain way. Um, you don't have to run it the same way the interactive thing runs, so it doesn't have to follow the same sequence of actions. What it's going to do is it's going to grab the beats.h file, um, and it's going to say, okay, these are the things I can do with a beat, and um, um, I can test it. So it doesn't have to be you're only working on one beat at a time, and then it goes into a track. Um, you can say, okay, we're going to take a beat on its own, and take another beat on its own, and test them separately, um, those kinds of things. So you're actually open to accessing beats.h and beats.c in a different way than you might necessarily access them through a normal main file, we're expecting it to run in a certain sequence of commands and that kind of thing. Yeah, as Abraham's saying, there's this idea of what's called an edge case. 
So if I'm looking at octaves, I'm going to go back to my code. Uh, Beats.h is the file I'm looking for. And octave says things like this. Negative 1 is negative, so not a valid octave. 10 is not less than 10, so not a valid octave. The valid octaves are 0, 1, through to 9. Um, so what we could do is we could test each of these edges. We test the 0 and the 9, and we test the negative 1 and the 10, and then we can see around the boundaries of where things are valid or invalid, whether our program is correct or not. That's definitely one way of testing um, that, that we will use a lot. And sometimes we might test something that's in the middle, like a 5. We could test a negative lots and a positive lots, just to make sure that it's not just at the edges that things are working, they're also working way out in the areas where things should and shouldn't work. Um, Yeah, okay, so Tom's, there might be some issues there that Tom's looking at in terms of um, stuff that Ryan's saying. If you input a null B, what should add notes to be written? All right, I'm going to let you deal with that one, Tom, because I think you're halfway through looking at that one at the moment. So, unless anyone has any more questions there, um, I will wrap it up. But I think uh, Abraham is asking a question there. How do we avoid off by one errors? I'm not sure if that was that a question, Abraham, or is that something, some advice that you're giving people? Because um, I think what we're talking about in terms of off by one errors are often the things that we do when we're working with arrays and things where we're numbering from zero, and we're thinking zero is the first element one is the second element and stuff and so it's always off by one from our logical thinking to the actual addressing the actual index of an array or something like that or in this case our octaves when they're zero through to nine um so one thing to always be careful of um yeah right i was just just helping yeah great yeah is that yes the 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 octaves are there are 10 octaves but number 10 is not an octave, same way that we were thinking about with arrays. Yeah, so testing those edge cases is kind of useful because as humans we tend to make the mistake that if there are 10 octaves, that 10 must be one of those octaves. So just to be a little bit careful with that. All right, I think we might wrap it up there because um, I didn't see any other questions. I think the questions have been happening in the live chat as we've been going on, so I'm happy for them to have been answered already like that. Uh, I don't know if you can hear it, my voice is, is trailing off at the moment. Um, I didn't take a break in the middle that I should have because I just had too much stuff I wanted to talk about. But I've covered everything I wanted to talk about, which I think is a lot of the information about how I think you should be approaching the second assignment and just uh, information on structure and stuff like that. So hopefully everyone's gotten what they need. Um, oh, that's pretty funny, Tom. <laughs> Anyway, I, I hope everyone's gotten what they need out of this. Um, so thanks for dropping by or watching the video later if you're watching the video. Um, hopefully it helps for the assignment. And I will see you all after the long weekend. I hope everyone has a good long weekend, even if that long weekend is stuck at home. Uh, at least maybe you've got some stuff to do at home. Maybe play some games. Maybe hang out with your family. Um, a, if you if you are Christian, it is Easter, so you know, observing Easter. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not religious, so I don't really know. Um, observing whatever it is you observe. Hopefully, the churches are doing stuff like live streaming like this, so that you can actually go to church without actually going near other people and spreading a virus or anything like that. So, hope everyone has a nice few days off, and we'll see you all next week. Bye.